stackoverflow.com is a Q&A site for engineers where anyone can go ask a question and anyone can go answer a question. Stack Overflow functions from a pool of applications and from the beginning we've depended on .NET to drive all of our applications. And when we heard about the advancements in .NET Core, we were really excited at the idea. We've been working on porting our entire application over to .NET Core. One major place that we've seen improvement is performance. .NET Core 3.0 has allowed us to build a much faster application and get information to our users faster than before. With .NET Core 3.0, we can build the app and run it on our Windows developers machines, our designers with Macs, and Enterprise in the Cloud on Linux, and build it one way, and that's tremendous. Right now, we live on our own servers in different areas throughout the country, and something we've always wanted to do is be able to use the cloud, and .NET Core allows us to do that. Azure is the best cloud platform for hosting .NET. Cloud deploys are also much simpler because there's just far fewer moving pieces for us to manage and deploy when we do upgrades. Right now, Stack Overflow's application exists as a large application. And through .NET Core 3.0, we can add more modularity to the different sections of the application. So that allows us to host the different modules in different areas, which allows us to experiment with things like Kubernetes and Docker. .NET Core 3.0 lets us run any container. This lets us ship an appliance to enterprise customers, dramatically lowering our support costs and making it easier to onboard customers. We can take a few of our auxiliary applications and just make them middleware, which means fewer apps to deploy and fewer apps to manage. It's the testability that really draws us to .NET Core. We can test a method end-to-end, -end, server, client, do things we could never do before in the old system. .NET Core being open source and on GitHub is very empowering to the community. We can find and fix issues and make suggestions for the benefit of everybody. It's amazing to be a part of the .NET Foundation. What the .NET Foundation is here to do is support .NET developers throughout the world. With .NET Core, I'm just not fighting all of the meta of building software. We can actually just go build the software. Hi, I'm Scott Hunter, and I'm here today with my team to announce .NET Core 3. To start off, let's talk about what .NET is. .NET is this platform we built for building any kind of application you have, whether it's a desktop application, a web application, cloud, mobile, gaming, IoT, AI. .NET is a general purpose framework for building all of these types of applications. Um, I'm super excited to talk about .NET Core and how far it's progressed. It's only been out for a few years, and we've already grown to over a million active .NET Core developers. Um, .NET Core is our first fully open source .NET framework. Um, and in the short time we've actually been open source, we've already taken 100,000 PRs. So we're building this not just by ourselves, but with the community. And of course, Visual Studio 2019 is the fastest, fastest adopted version of Visual Studio ever. Here's a couple of our customers that we that, to build on top of .NET. Um, we have an awesome page on the .NET website you can go to to see all of these customers and read the stories behind them. So I highly recommend you go and check that out after the conference. Let's talk about .NET Core 3. Um, you can actually download this right now. You can go to the .NET website and get it right now. The bits are available. Um, and it brings a bunch of awesome enhancements to .NET Core. Uh, first off, we brought desktop support for WPF and Windows Forms. Um, any .NET Core application gets the ability to be fully side-by-side -side and self-contained, meaning .NET doesn't have to be on the machine. Uh, we just introduced, we're going to introduce a brand new way of building web applications where every web application is a SPA application. And then of course we're always making you more productive with Visual Studio, C Sharp, um, and we're going to talk about a lot of these things today with my team. To start off as well, Visual Studio 2019 16.3 just shipped as well, along with Visual Studio 2019 for Mac 8.3. Both of these versions of Visual Studio support .NET Core 3, C Sharp 8. Uh, they have a ton of productivity improvements, performance improvements, and if you're a mobile developer, they support iOS 13 and Android 10. So they support all the latest stuff. A bunch of our partners have released brand new tools today for .NET Core 3. If you're a web developer and you're going to use Blazor, our new SPA application, uh, there's controls by DevExpress, Telerik, and more that are available today. Um, so please try these things out as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is microservices. Um, microservices is a, is a new developer phenomenon that's taken over in the last couple of years. 
Um, when I first started doing development, we build these what we call monolithic, ap monolithic applications where you build your database and your front end and your back end all together in a combined application. That was great when we had small teams building applications, but as these applications have gotten bigger and crossed into more spaces, um, it's more important to break them out into smaller pieces so those individual teams can actually work on those pieces. So not only can you build microservices, but you can also host microservices really, really well in Kubernetes. What Kubernetes does for you um, is it's an orchestrator, and that orchestrator will basically um, take your application and manage all the components, whether it's configuration, whether it's scaling, whether it's making sure the application is still running well. Um, and we have an awesome one of these called Azure Kubernetes that runs in our Azure cloud. Now, with .NET Core 3, it's the first version of .NET Core that really, really, really enables you to build microservices. Um, so what we've done is we've added a bunch of new features. One is we have something called gRPC. What gRPC is, it's a, it's a form of communication that gives you strongly typed contracts between the application. But what makes it unique is it actually works across all developer technologies. We're going to show it in the context of, of .NET and C Sharp today. But what's cool is you can actually build a microservice using gRPC, and you can call it from Java, you can call it from Node, you can call it from Python. Any of the languages you want will support this. Uh, the next thing is worker services. While we built great web frameworks the last couple of years, as you start thinking about microservices, you want these long-running applications that handle responses, uh, requests and responses. And so we now have a first-class template inside of Visual Studio and .NET Core 3 that lets you build these worker services. What's cool about this is you get all the same features. You get the configuration, the dependency injection, all the logging, all those things that .NET Core brings are available there as well. And we're going to show that a little bit later on. And then finally, as you build these APIs, you want to make sure they're super secure. And so what we've done is we've actually uh, worked with one of our partners to make sure that you can actually securely secure your endpoints using Identity Server. And so with that, what I'm going to do next is we're going to have Glenn Condron come on stage, and we're going to build a .NET Core 3 microservice uh, and host it up in Azure. Hello. Hey, Glenn. Hi, how's it going? It's going great. Why don't you switch to your machine and let's show us, uh, yeah, show us sure. a microservice. Yeah, so a bit of context for what we're going to do here is I am going to build this weather microservice, this service, and then all of my friends after this, they're all going to come in and they're going to consume this thing from an uh, AKS cluster. So. Uh, I am going to encapsulate the logic of going and grabbing the weather data. I'm going to cache it locally, make sure I honor expires. So it's, not, it's not complicated, but it's not trivial. So we'll make our own service for it instead of having everybody talk to the weather API themselves. Show us some so code. what I have here is I have a just a normal uh, file new gRPC service. I have a console app and I have a not standard class library we're going to use later, but they're all standard except that in my weather app, I have already set up some config for the URI and I've put in some user secrets and stuff so that you know you all don't try and steal all of my tokens. So, first thing we need is a worker. So, I am going to add this class. We're going to call it weather worker. All right? And this thing's responsibility is going to be to go and grab the weather data and get it in the cache locally. All right? And like this, so I have some snippets for pretty much all of my all of my code. And so this inherits from background service, which we had a little while ago. This is how you can add a service that'll run forever. You know, I've got to do some logging, some config. I need config to get my URI, and then in Kubernetes, it actually uses the Kubernetes config provider to grab all of the secrets from Kubernetes secrets, which is kind of cool. Uh, I have a hard coded location ID because you know you don't need any other weather than that what's in Redmond. Um, and then the meat of this is this execute async method. And all it's going to do is loop for as long as the app is going, make a HTTP client, going to go and call the weather API, get some, get some JSON response, use the new system text JSON that we added to deserialize that to a type, and then cache it. And then it's going to do that every 10 minutes forever for as long as the app's running. And so I'm missing this forecast data. This is how does the weather endpoint I'm hitting represent the weather. And so I'm going to add another class to represent that. Call it weather model .cs. You know, if I can not put some uh, some extra caps in. So, what I did to generate this, I have a snippet here for this now. What I did to generate this, and what you can do is, I just grabbed an example JSON payload from the API, and I just copied and pasted as C sharp into Visual Studio, and just made this whole thing for me. And I'm just going to ignore it. 
That's a cool feature. Visual yeah. Studio can basically take your JSON and, con and convert it to C-sharp types. Yeah, absolutely. It's a super cool feature. Um, then, OK, so now I have a worker. This is done. I'm good now. Um, but except I need to tell the app that it's got to go run that worker service. So now over here, I'm going to start doing some code. I'm going to add dot add hosted service, which is the name of this feature, add weather worker, right? And then uh, this needed a few things. It needed like HTTP and like caching, right? So services dot add HTTP client, so I can inject the HTTP client, and then I'm going to add the uh, memory cache, uh, memory cache, so that it has a memory cache, right? This now when I boot this app, it's going to go and every ten minutes go and get some more weather data. Pretty simple, pretty cool. Now I need an endpoint. So Scott talked earlier about uh, gRPC and some strongly typedness. So, um, so this gRPC is a very uh, contract-driven approach to RPC. So I have a snippet here which gives me this proto file, which is the contracts for a gRPC service. And so I have this proto file that says I'm going to make a weather service. It's going to have a get weather streaming endpoint, which it should stream weather constantly. And it has a get weather that just returns you a single whatever the current weather is. And it also defines what the actual response type is. Nice thing about making our own like proxy for this weather data is we get to choose the actual surface for our clients and make it relevant and not have too much extraneous data, right? So if we just call this weather.proto, and then in here, the way this actually works is in my CS proj, I have this proto buff element, which references that weather proto. You see the rename worked. Good job, team. And it says it's going to generate server, because the way that gRPC works is you create a contract, and then you generate a lot of code. And you just implement the bits that matter, and you leave all the rest to be generated. Right. I write that contract, and I generate either a client or a server using the tools. Yeah, exactly. And so then we're going to go create a weather service now from my, uh, from my snippet. And so what we have here is a service that implements this weather base. And that's that generated code that we just talked about. Where, so we just controlled on my way to glory here. I have the base class. I have a memory cache because I need to get the data out of the memory cache. And then gRPC doesn't want you to have empty method calls, but because I'm hard coding the weather for Redmond in this case, I've just got this empty type to, to fill in for the request type. You would probably in most cases have an actual type here that has your data, right? Yeah, past your location yeah. or something. Yeah, something, yeah. And then I just have this get current weather response. All it does is left hand, right hand code to say, take that pasted code, the pasted model earlier, Convert it to the one that we want to actually give to all of our uh, all of our friends later, and then get weather returns one, and then for get weather stream, it just loops for as long as the person is connected. It just grabs the data out of whatever's in the cache currently, and then loops. Right, and then this is to every ten seconds, just so that it's easy, so you can see something. For the sake of the demo, we might actually even make this two seconds, just so you can see some data constantly changing. We know the data will only actually change every ten minutes or so, but you want to keep, kind of keep a constant stream happening, right? And then that's it. That's greeter service. So if we'll rename this to weather service, so that you know, just because um, we can't have a class with a different file name. That'd be terrible. And then in our startup CS, the way you register these services is we have a map gRPC service. Endpoint, right? So now I can change this to weather service. And that's it. At this point, my app can run and it'll go do its job. And so now you want a client to go grab some of this weather data to test it out. So um, I, we, I added this console app earlier, conveniently. But I also added this weather client lib. So I could go over here to my client console and then add a ref to the proto file and have it generate the client code straight into my console app or any of the like, .NET stuff that we're going to show today. But what I can also do is I can come over here. I have a completely empty .NET standard class library, except for like the default class, which I'm going to delete. Right? And then I can uh, right click on this and say, add service reference. And then click Add New gRPC Service Reference, browse to the proto file that I had earlier, that are the same proto file that my weather app is using to generate the server code. And then I can say Generate Client, though, here in this drop down. Right? Instead of, there's some other options for what you can generate. I'm generating a client in this case. And then just going OK. And this is going to go install all the NuGet goodness that you need to make gRPC generate code and generate all the types that you need. So this is pretty cool. So you built a service. So we built our first microservice. Mm -hmm. We installed gRPC into that, mm -hmm. and now you want to write a client, so all you had to do is basically reference that same proto file from your service and your mm -hmm. client, 
and we'll generate all the code for you. Absolutely, yeah. And you just then it generates you kind of the base. Yeah, it generates you all of the codes for the client's cast. Yeah, absolutely. Then all I can do is new it up and start making calls. Yeah, and so let's look at what that looks like. So I'm just going to add a normal project reference now to my client class library because everybody can now share this net standard class library that has the client code generated in it. Um, or they can choose to reference it directly. And then in my program CS, I have, a, um, I have another snippet here where the client, right? And whoop, I think it's actually the whole, the whole class I did this time. And then um, what I'm, so yeah, you can see here, like as you just said, this weather client was all generated for me. I just, I just knew it up, I used this channel type to give it the address, and then I have a strongly typed method for get weather async, which was you in just, my contract file. You just start calling the methods start and calling getting the results it. back and write them out to the console. Absolutely. So now I can like control F5 this weather service, it'll spin up on my local machine, you'll see that we'll see the console output in a sec. It's going to see the output, go fetch the data, and then sit there and be a gRPC endpoint. And then, so here you can see it going and getting the data and then being ready. And then over here, I can then like go debug, start new instance of my, of my client Your console. Client. And my client console will ping up. It's going to grab a single weather and then just say done in this case, because that's I'm just grabbing a, calling a single weather um, endpoint asynchronously. I'm using async like console app that we added a little while ago. And then it's like apparently 53. Seems reasonable. So that's pretty awesome. So in just a few minutes, we built a brand new project using the worker service. Yep. Long running process for, like you would build a microservice. Yep. Um, that goes out and fetches weather from uh, an endpoint somewhere, and then we actually add a gRPC to that service, yep. so a client can call into that and get that weather data back. Yep, absolutely. Well, let's switch back to the slides for a second, and uh, we'll talk about C Sharp. Uh, so, along with .NET Core 3, we're also shipping the next version of C Sharp, C Sharp 8. Um, it has a bunch of new stuff, and we kind of broke it down into buckets. One, one of the things we think about is, we always want to make your code safer to write. We want to make it easier for you to catch the errors early or prevent the errors from ever occurring. And so there's some new features called Nullable in C Sharp 8 that try to address some of that stuff. Modern as well, as we, as we look at uh, language, we always are looking at other languages and we're looking at the patterns that developers are using today. And so uh, one of the cool features we have in C Sharp 8 is uh, async streams. Um, and we're going to show those in a, in a little bit. And then productive. We always want to make you more productive. So the goal of C Sharp is to add the right features and stuff to make it easier for you to write code and write code faster with less, less text in the screen. At the same time, also tooling all that with Visual Studio family so you can actually be more productive. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to bring Mads on and we're going to take the demo that Glenn had and uh, you know, Glenn didn't really write it the best way you could. We're going to, we're going to make it use async streams. Well, I think Glenn did a fantastic job. Um, it's just that um, when he uh, switch back to the laptop, laptop let's here. switch back to the laptop and look at the um, um, the proto file that, that Glenn put up there. There were actually uh, two endpoints here. There was the get weather that he used that he called just before from the client, and there's a get weather stream which continues to stream weather down. So that's the one we're going to uh, investigate now. If I can find my way back to the program here. Um, so there's if you look at the um, if you look at the client here, um, it also has a get weather stream method. So that's probably the one we're going for. And uh, that can't be awaited. Um, instead, we get something that we're going to explore a little bit. So let's just call it response for now. Um, and let's start drilling into it. So if we say response dot, we see that it has a response stream. That sounds streamy. Let's do that. Um, and that one has a read all async. That sounds streamy and async. That so sounds that's pretty good, right? Let's do that one. Um, so if I call that, um, then what do I get back? That's, uh, we can actually drill into that as well. Let's try to just F12 our way through. There's read all async. Um, it returns something called iAsync enumerable of t. And iAsync enumerable, uh, if people remember, uh, iAnumerable is a core type. And iAnumerable of t is a core type in .NET that you can for each. And, um, and produce new ones uh, from the language as well with, um, with yield return, with iterators. And so iAsync normal is just, um, it's just an async version of that. And we can actually, if we take a very quick look down the rabbit hole here, iAsync enumerable, um, just like enumerable has a get enumerator, this has a get async enumerator. And if we drill into that, 
you can see that it has a current property for the value that we're currently looking at, and it has a move next method, but this one is async. Right? So if you think about it, this is a stream where you can pull elements, but every time you pull a new one, you do it asynchronously. So it might take time, and you, might, you have to wait it. Okay. So that's how that works under the hood. Now, uh, at the language level, we would like to support for reaching over these. So let's try to for each over the, um, the thing that we got back from our drilling here. So let's call that for casts with an S because we hope there are multiple. And then we can, let's try to for each over it. For each var forecast in forecasts. Um, and now what we get is, oh, this thing can't actually be for each. It, it, and that's because in C Sharp, we decided you shouldn't just be able to for each over async things, because then you can't look at your code and see. And know they're async. And know that they, you're doing something async. Right? We want every await to be visible in the source code. So you can know that you're sort of getting off the thread, you're doing an async thing, you're, it's a point where context might switch and so on. So um, what we have instead is an await for each cool. syntax that then um, you use when you have an I, uh, an I async enumerable. And let's just put the right curlies in there for for the beauty contest, and, um, and we're good. So now we've actually called a streaming endpoint, and now we sat and did an async loop around that endpoint. Yes. It, the code, honestly, to me, Mads, you just took a for each and just added a wait in front of it, and yeah. it works. I tried to make a big deal of it, but it's That's actually pretty simple. Pretty amazing. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated feature, but it looks so simple when you actually use it. So. Right. And some, you know, there more, there's more to it. You can actually yield return in an async method as well now, returning async in a mobile. So we have, you know, async um, yield return. That's pretty useful, right? Um, amazing. And. Um, um, also, there's cancellation built in that I kind of skipped over here, yeah. but you, we, so there's a little more to it. Well, it is, the idea is it should be simple. Later today, you're going to have more talks on C Sharp 8. We're going to drill into more and more features than just the, uh, the async stream that we That's exactly here. right. Yeah. So, so, so just after the, a little after the keynote, there'll be two talks. And perfect. Thank you. Let's go back to the slides, and we're going to talk about desktop. Um, so Today, we have still millions of developers building desktop applications. You might ask, why? Well, because desktop applications are simple to write. Uh, web applications are hard. They require knowing HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and a bunch of stuff. Desktop applications in .NET, you can just drag some controls to a form, write some code. They're very quick and simple. Uh, we've made them much, much better in .NET Core 3. So in .NET Core 3, we've brought WinForms and WPF uh, to .NET Core. Uh, but you get all the benefits of .NET Core. So one of those benefits is side-by-side -side deployments. You no longer have to worry about an update of the framework breaking your application. You can even take the app or, or the, the, the framework and compile it directly into a single XE for your application. So you just hand that, that application to any machine. It doesn't even have to have .NET Core on it. Um, that's a cool feature in .NET Core 3. Uh, we've made all of the Windows 10 APIs available to these applications as well. So you can call all the things. If you want to get Bluetooth or something like that, you can do that from a WinForm or WPF application. And then finally, because it's .NET Core, we do all of it open source. And so we've open sourced WinForms and WPF. Now, what I'm going to do next is talk about App Center. This is a new announcement today. I'm, I'm, I started off as a web developer. And App Center for desktop applications really excites me. Because for the first time ever, if you're a web developer, you can just add some kind of analytics to your website, and you're going to know how many people called it, where they're from, how long they were on the site. Wouldn't you want that same information for your desktop applications? If you're building a desktop application, you likely want to know how many times it's been used. Are all the features being used? And so by adding App Center to your application, you get all those benefits. App Center can also be used to deploy the application, including beta versions of the applications, to a smaller set of people. Uh, so super ex excited to announce that. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to bring Ollie on stage, and we're going to go build a .NET Core 3 desktop application, and then we're going to actually hook it up with App Center so we can get telemetry on it as well. Right. So let's switch to the machine here. <clears throat> and the theme we're going to have today is as we start building applications, you know, we built that microservice. Um, now what you're going to see us do is basically build more applications on top of that thing, showing you can build .NET everywhere um, and share your code. Right. So I happen to have a better application myself. And that application, it's a WinForms app that sits on your desktop and shows you what is the weather right now. Let me show it to you. 
It's very simple, um, but it has one problem. I haven't actually finished development of that app. I put together UI, I put some dummy data that shows the weather on Alderaan planet right now. I was going to say that planet doesn't exist anymore, so I've I That is why it data. is so cold, yes. But I would like to actually show the real data for, say, Seattle. And I just heard that Glenn has amazing service running in Kubernetes, and he also has a client library that I can just use in my WinForms application. Let's do that. Right? And not only that, we can actually use it from any .NET application, right? Mobile, web, WPF. So let's take a look at the library that Glenn created for us. If I right-click on Properties, I can see that this library is targeting .NET Standard 2.1, which is great because that's the latest version of .NET Standard. .NET Standard 2.1 ships with .NET Core 3, so it's the it's the latest version of .NET Standard that supports .NET Core 3, but it also only runs on .NET Core 3, so that probably means Yes, exactly. Is your application a, a .NET Core 3 desktop app, or is it a no, .NET Framework? No, it's Framework, because I developed it a while ago where I did not have a cho choice between Core and Framework. So if we go to Properties, we can see that my app is targeting .NET Framework 4.8. I cannot reference the library right now, but what I can do, I can port my framework application to .NET Core, and then I will be able to use Glenn's library. And to do that, we created a tool called TryConvert that will take your .NET Framework project file, and it will try to convert it to new SDK-style .NET Core project file. It's simple command line tool, I'm going to type tryconvert.exe and as a parameter I'm going to send the path to my project file. And so if people understand, uh, for .NET Core, the project files are different than they are for .NET Framework. Right. And so what we built is we built a global tool that can be installed on a machine, it's a sample, yeah. uh, to help people convert their CS proj from an old style CS proj to yes. a .NET Core style CS yes, proj. Yes, exactly. And now, when I click on properties in my Visual Studio, I can see that now my application is targeting .NET Core 3.1, right? So easy. In just a few seconds, I ported my framework application to .NET Core. Cool. So now I can reference the library. And to do so, I'm going to right click on dependencies, add reference, find weather client lib, click OK. And once I did that, let's go ahead and update my code that is pulling dummy data at this moment. So I have this method pull weather that uh, just gets dummy data. And I'm not going to need this code anymore. I will also not need the get dummy data. And here I was using the local weather response class, but I'm going to be using the one from the client library. So I'm going to delete that code as well. Now I will insert a few lines of code. I will add usings, and I will talk to those lines. So first thing that I do here, I'm creating a client from the library. Then, based on that client, I'm creating gRPC weather forecast service. And for this forecast service I'm calling get streaming weather. So every time the service on Kubernetes is sending out the weather data, uh, every two seconds I'm getting the data on my app. And let's see how that works. So this code looks almost exactly like the same code that, that yes, Glenn and yes, Azure exactly. showed us a second ago, what they were calling, right. the same await, the same stuff. Yep. So we're showing sharing .NET code across all my application types. Yeah. Awesome. And that <coughs> looks like a real date. I see at all 53 degrees. And weather doesn't change that often, but you can see that I'm actually receiving yeah. new data every two seconds. So once I build the application, now I probably want to share it with my friends, maybe even community, right? I'd love to show, have, have us look at that new feature we talked about, single exe. That's, that's a great idea. Let's publish it as a single exe file. And to do that, I'm going to go to project file. And let me move everything down so it doesn't distract us. And I'm going to insert three lines of code. The first line, publish single file 
will make package my application and .NET Core in a single exe file. The same, all .NET Core, yes. all your application in one single exe. Yeah. <clears throat> so nothing has to be on the machine that you give the exactly. The person yes, to. it's completely independent on, from the environment it's going to be running Super on. Super cool. The second one, runtime identifier, specifies which platform my exe should target. And by default, .NET Core can run on any platform, but if we're publishing it as a single exe file, we need to specify runtime identifier. And the third one is publish streamed. That is a new feature that will trim out all assemblies from your .NET Core that are not used by your application. So that way, you don't get the entire .NET Core. You get only assemblies that you need for your app, cool. which makes the size much smaller. All right. Once I added that to my project file, I'm going to right click and go Publish, and Publish one more time. And while it's publishing, we can see that here you can specify the path where that single exe will be put. You can also specify configuration, target framework, target runtime. All those settings can be set from this page as well. And it takes a while because right now trimmer feature is working, so it's actually analyzing what we can throw right. away. It basically right. goes and looks at your app, figures out what the dependencies are as best yes. it can. It's not perfect. We call it experimental at this point. Yes. So yeah. you might find that it actually trims too much stuff out, and you have to go back to your CS proj and manually ref yeah. add a reference to whatever it trimmed out too hard. That is true. Um, but We'll build better tech around this in the future, <laughs> and we'll build, yeah. build better tooling, but it is a, a first step that we wanted to ship in .NET Core 3. Yes. And as you said, if it trims something out, it's very easy to add it back to your project file. Right. OK, so we published our single exe, and here it is, just one exe file that I can send to my friends, that I can put out for the community, and they will be just able to run it and use the app. On any computer that has, you know, that does not even require .NET Core. Yes, yes. So the last thing that I would like to show today is uh, integration with App Center. Yes. Because as you mentioned, web developers have been spoiled for a few years where they could see analytics for their websites. They could see how many users they got, which devices that was accessed from, and so on. And we would like to enable our desktop developers with the same features. So for that, you can use App Center. Let me go to my. App Center portal. It's appcenter.ms. I created an account, and here you can create a new application. You can configure it, but I already did it for my app. It's Weather WinForms app. Once you do it, you will get very detailed instructions on how to add integration with App Center in your program. And it's super simple. You just add a few NuGet packages, and then you add a few lines in your project uh, program.cs file. So I will do exactly that. I'm going to first go and add new Git packages that are required, which are Microsoft App Center Analytics. Okay. And the second one is Microsoft App Center Crashes. Right. Once I edit it, I'm going to go to program.cs file, and I will add some usings. And this is how I enable App Center in my app. Two lines of code, and that's all it's, you got to do. Yeah. It's basically just one line, appcenter.start, and I send the key that I get from the console, and I specify what I want for my uh, App Center, it's analytics and crashes. Now so. you get detailed crash analytics, and you're going to get monitoring as well, letting, letting you know that people actually tried the project. Exactly. And uh, I'm going to run it, but it will take the portal a few seconds. So if we go here and we go to analytics, you can see some analytics. So you can see that I was testing that demo on September 20 and September 23rd, just today. And you can see a few spikes. We will have another demo later today with Daniel and Matt that will go deeper and dive into all details of all the great features that App Center can offer. 
And with that... Awesome. So, so yeah. uh, to recap, what you can do now is you can basically build desktop applications with .NET Core 3, WinForms and WPF. Um, you can make them into single exes. They can easily be distributed. Uh, you can add rich analytics with uh, Azure App Center. Awesome. I'm so, so excited about this. So let's Thank move back to slides. Uh, next, I want to talk about mobile apps with Xamarin. So Xamarin is awesome technology that lets you take all the goodness of .NET and make it available to all the mobile devices. Um, so the idea here is you can build any iOS and Android app with C Sharp. And why would you want to do this? Well, you want to do this because .NET's got all these rich libraries uh, that you can share across all these applications. So for example, that microservice that we showed before, um, we probably can share that across Android and iOS. Uh, that's one of the tenets of, of, of .NET and C Sharp and, and, and Xamarin is being able to actually share the same logic across all your app types, uh, Android or iOS. Um, another cool part of it is we have a, a library for building apps called Xamarin Forms. Basically, you build it once and it runs on all the devices. Um, and of course, also, all the Xamarin tech is, is open source like the rest of .NET. Um, today, we have two awesome announcements. The first one is XAML Hot Reload. Imagine you're in your application and you're going to change some of the XAML files. Well, you don't really want to recompile and republish and wait for all, all that kind of stuff to happen. What you want to do is you want to basically save your XAML file and have your device refresh immediately. Uh, even better than that, XAML, or Xamarin Hot Restart, which is the ability to also change the source code. Normally, when you change the source code, that's a full recompile, copy back to the device. Uh, I want to be able to change that code and refresh very fast as well. And so this one's in private preview today. Uh, you can go to the URL and sign up and you might get access. Uh, the hot reload is actually available to download today. And so next what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up James and he's going to show us how to build some Xamarin apps. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Scott, so much. Now you're in my way because you know I need to get to my Mac. Get to your Mac. Okay, awesome. Well, like Scott said, I love .NET development with Xamarin inside of Visual Studio. Uh, what I love is that, like Scott said, you can share all of your C-sharp and .NET knowledge across all of your applications. And that's what we've done. I decided that I wanted to take that weather app and port it to iOS and Android, and at the same time, leverage that same exact gRPC logic that Olia used and that we're going to use throughout the rest of the day. Now, two important things to remember. Like Scott said, we have all sorts of different texts of uh, pieces of technology for cross-platform development. But with Xamarin, you have access to 100% of the APIs in iOS and Android and always up to date. We just shipped iOS 13 and Android 10 support. So on top of that, we have Xamarin Forms for cross-platform UI and Xamarin Essentials for cross-platform native API access. So let's go ahead and port that exact same weather application to iOS and Android taking advantage of mobile features. So here I am on let's my switch, Mac. Let's switch to the Mac, yes. This is my Mac, boom. And of course, I need to get started with a great design. I'm not a designer, Scott, sorry. Uh, but Guzman Barquin was nice enough to have this amazing weather application on Uplabs, which is one of my favorite websites to use for mobile design, and reached out to him. He's super happy um, <laughs> that we're able to use it, and I'm super happy that he's an amazing designer. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm over inside of Visual Studio for Mac. We uh, just launched a brand new version with all sorts of new tech, so I want to show that off too. But where you get started is File New Project. You have cross-platform apps, you have iOS, Android, .NET Core apps, Azure Functions, Mac, tvOS, watchOS, everything is possible with Xamarin and .NET. So what I've done over here is I've added an Android and an iOS project, and I also have this mobile core. It's a .NET standard library, just like we can use to share across all things of .NET, but it has Xamarin Forms in there. And this is my mobile-specific code. So this is things like my user interface with Xamarin Forms, my models, my view models, my app state. But notice that I have that weather client lib that Olia used that Glenn had created. So it's inside of Visual Studio for Mac, and I can reuse it right here inside the weather app. So that mobile core, that's the differentiator for Xamarin, right? That mobile core is the code that is shared across the iOS and the Android app. So yeah. you write it once and it gets to be used in all the, all the devices. You can think of it, most of my apps have two different .NET standard libraries. One that can be shared with anything. So RESTful service calls, models, things that are just, hey, this is .NET code. Then I have my platform specific code or mobile specific code. And this UI runs on iOS and Android. Right. So. So for instance here, if we take a look at how I built this app, is I have a weather page and a weather view model. So here up top, um, I have a view model, I have a 
weather client and this gRPC weather forecast service, the same exact code that Olia was showing earlier. And since I'm going to be using XAML and data binding, I have some backing fields. So for instance, I have a use Celsius, a temperature, condition, timestamp. These are things that my user interface is going to display. And I can tell it to update via set property. But here, if we look at this, message weather service get streaming weather. Same code. The only difference here is that I'm telling it how to render the user interface. So here's a bunch of items I want to display in a list. And then when I want to update the UI, I use Xamarin Essentials to say, begin invoking this logic on the UI thread, because that gRPC could be coming in from anywhere. Right. So let me just go ahead and run this uh, really quick. So I'm just going to hit debug. This is going to take my application logic, compile up my Android application, and then deploy it to an Android emulator right here running on my Mac. So there we go. My application is starting up. And what we should see, hopefully, is a beautiful weather application that I built um, inside of XAML. All right, it's, um, it's doing some stuff. But let's go ahead and fill this in a little bit more. So I have my user interface code down here. And uh, let's see here. I have a, a pancake view, which is a beautiful third-party control um, that will allow me to do the gradients in the background. But I think I'm missing some stuff. OK, so I have a label with nothing in it. So let's just put in Seattle. Now I'm going to use that XAML hot reload. So I'm going to hit Command Save. It's going to save that and push the changes over into my device. So Seattle, right there. Now what we can also note down here is I'm missing some other things in my UI. So for instance here, we can go ahead and maybe put in a new column. And then I'm going to say binding. And the brand new XAML IntelliSense will kick in. And I can say temperature. There we go. Now, it does look like, for some reason, my internet has stopped. So that's good. And I'm getting no updates. So things are working exactly as planned because we're doing it all live, which is super great. But I have zero degrees, so it did show up. So that's really good. Uh, it's all very, right. very cold in here. <laughs> it's very cold in here, yeah. So um, other things that we can do inside of here, for instance, is like this, this Monday here. So that's just showing up blank. Uh, so if I look here on the date, what we can see is that um, I have current weather conditions. I have this date property here. And maybe I want to change this to a, um, a capital casing. So I can say use a, a case converter, say true, hit a save. And now that Monday is completely updated 100%. Now, what I'll do here, because I did change internet right before, um, we're going to go ahead and stop and redeploy again <laughs> and bring up a new emulator um, and see if we can get our internet back on our machine, uh, which would be very helpful if so. Um, but you can see actually how fast the emulator rebooted here. So let's go ahead and see if this is going to spice up for me, because having real data would be useful. Oh, always fun to show the real <laughs> microservice. <laughs> but you can see how rapidly iterating I was on that user interface using XAML hot reload inside my application. So there we go. We have ah, weather. Data. Oh, hey. Um, cool. So one last thing I want to do down here, actually two things is I like this um, collection view, which is like all the different humidity, UV down here. And that's a brand new feature inside of Xamarin Forms. So here I can say horizontal or vertical. But I'm using a pancake view. So I'm going to add a fancy corner radius here and hit Save again. Again, XAML Hot Reload kicks right in. Boom, I got beautiful rounded. So fast. So fast. But you know, I like teardrops, um, which are new hotness I think everyone's going to pick up. Boom, look at that. That's great. And I can prove that this is running in real time because down here, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and say timestamp large. And now we can see the timestamp from that gRPC client updating in real time right there, which is super awesome. And that's XAML hot reload right there inside of Visual Studio for Mac with all that gRPC client, beautiful user interface, boom, right there. Now, what I need to do, though, is also deploy this to iOS. So normally, I would just say, you know, set that as my startup project, go into my iOS simulator, boom, good to go. But I want to show off some brand new features of Hot Restart. So I'm going to actually head to my Windows machine right now and do iOS development. So let's swap places over here. I love this. Here we go. Android on the Mac and iOS on the Windows machine. That's correct. So I'm right over here. Now, what I want to talk about, though, is that it is the same projects, same solutions that I just had open in Visual Studio for Mac. So no matter where you're working, you're good to go. I know you're a Mac guy. I'm a Windows guy. So ideal setup right here. 
So that's going to make it really easy to go back and forth. And again, I have my shared code, and I also have that iOS project and that shared code and everything else that I have in here. Now, what we wanted to do with Hot Restart is that every once in a while you're changing C Sharp code. For example, Hot Reload, user interface code. You need to be able to rapidly iterate on your app. But what happens when you want to get it on your device? And that's some of the cool tech built into Hot Restart. So what you're able to do, and what I have here is my iPhone, right here, my iPhone 7, that's plugged in to my Windows machine, okay? And what I have up top is my iPhone, right there. It's connected, it's good to go. And what's nice here is that all I have to do is hit debug. If you've ever done this before, you gotta worry about configurations and connections and profiles and certs and all this stuff. But what we're able to do with this technology is restart your application directly on to your device. So here, for instance, I have my device that should be screen mirroring. Let's go ahead and see if it's going to cooperate with me. Let's go ahead and maybe shut it down and reopen it. Let's do this really quick here. There we go. And perfect. So there's my device. I'll put it right over here. So there's my device right there on the screen. Now, what's great about this is that I can come into my UI. Let's go ahead and just make this sticky on top. Cool. That looks good. And what I can do is add some new technology into here. So for instance, maybe I want to convert this into Celsius. So again, I'll just uncomment some code. I have a checkbox. I have a label. This is data bound to that use Celsius. I'm going to hit save. Now, XAML Hot Reload will kick in. And notice that it's reloaded. I hit a breakpoint. I'm debugging my app right wow. here um, on my device. So I can go ahead and continue on. Good to go. Um, all right, that's good. I must have made some changes to my code that weren't compatible. But no worries. I can just literally use hot, uh, uh, hot uh, restart here to redeploy again. So let's go ahead and deploy. There we go. And you just saw, like, I stopped, took that, took some changes. Good to go. I see you back on the phone already. And now it's back on the phone, yeah. So this is initializing that debug session and uh, XAML hot reload. So here's our app. Here's everything is good. And now we have this little back and forth. But as you can see, Scott, we have some issues because I hot reloaded that UI, but the temperature is not, not changing. Converting. Now the background is, so my converters, my code is running. So let's fix this. If I go into my view model here, we have that temperature property. Now it's returning temp, so that's not good. So what I'll do is I'm going to say use Celsius. I have full IntelliSense, everything here. We're going to use Xamarin Essentials. What's cool about this is it has a bunch of unit converters built in. So you can do like Hertz to degrees, Kelvin to Celsius. Here I'm going to say Fahrenheit to Celsius. And I'll pass it the temp, else just temp. There we go. Make that temp. There we go. Now what we can see is that the UI is telling me that, hey, I've made C Sharp code changes to my application. You need to restart your app. And what we can do right here is hit the restart button. And this will take all of my code changes that I made, redeploy it to my device without having to compile it at all. And what's great is that this is literally right to my device in just mere seconds. Those squiggles go away. The application is now back into a debug session that I would expect earlier. And what we should hopefully see here, once hot reload Ooh, initialize, yeah. I can hit Celsius. Now we're in Celsius. And I can use my app, my real data, use XAML hot reload for my UI, and hot restart when I'm making code changes and deploy directly to my device in seconds with nothing in between. That is amazing. I have never seen mobile development on either platform, the, on the Mac or Windows, deploy to devices and restart as fast as I've seen with the hot reload and the hot restart. That, yeah. This is a game changer. We want to focus on developer productivity, make sure that our developers building mobile apps with .NET have the most enjoyable time without anything in between, no big setup, and boom. Between those two technologies, you're going to be hyper productive and share all of your .NET logic like you've seen before. Across That's all awesome. the devices. All your apps. Thanks, Beautiful. James. Let's go back to the slides. And what we're going to talk about next is building web applications with Blazor. So, uh, the way I like to think of this is if you're building web applications, we've had awesome web frameworks in .NET for many, many years. Um, but the web has transitioned to this new, new place where all apps are SPA. And so, what if we could just take the technology we already have today and say, you build any brand new ASP.NET Core Blazor application, that's an, it looks like Razor, 
Blazor Razor, um, and those applications just become SPAs by default. That's what Blazor is all about. It's full stack web development. You build an application in .NET, it's a SPI app. Using the same uh, frameworks and the same technologies you're used to already. You don't have to relearn a bunch of new stuff. Uh, the cool thing about this tech is it also runs in all the browsers. Uh, so it's compatible with all the browsers that are out there, whether it's mobile or desktop. Um, and even cooler, there's one, one final piece, which is we have a, a prototype or uh, uh, in preview thing called WebAssembly. And WebAssembly lets you take your web application and run it directly on the device. That means uh, you don't have to actually, it can be completely disconnected. Uh, it can be running on a desktop, it can be running on a mobile device, um, and running as a, like a real desktop application. We do that because we can compile your C-sharp directly into WebAssembly that can run natively in all the browsers. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to have Dan Roth come on stage, and he's going to show us how to build a Blazor app. Hi, Scott. With .NET Core 3. Yeah, great. Shall we build a single page web app for our weather application using only .NET and C Sharp? No, 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 JavaScript. no JavaScript. No JavaScript required. All right, cool. So I'm going to get close down some of this stuff so I can see my app. Let me get rid of this. There we go. Okay. So to get started with Blazor. All you need is .NET Core 3.0 because support for Blazor server apps is now in the box. So I'm going to stop uh, change this app and I'm going to open up a new Visual Studio instance. And we'll just go ahead and create uh, uh, our first Blazor app so we can just get a feel for how it's done. So I'm going to create a new project and let's create a Blazor app. There it is, right there in the box. Blazor app 1 sounds like a great name. And then for this app, I'm going to pick the Blazor server version. We'll talk more about the WebAssembly version in just a second. All right, and then we'll go ahead and get this running. All right, so we can take a quick look at this application in the project and see that there's no, there's no JavaScript here, right? It's just Razor files and C Sharp. Let's go ahead and control F5 so we can see what the application does. And these Razor files are the same Razor files our developers have been using for the last nine years. Yeah, so uh, these are uh, a combination of HTML and C Sharp and it's used to dynamic, dynamically render your application. So I want to start, whoops, sorry. Do I start without the debugger. And we'll get this going. And then we'll see what this app does. Now, this will be a simple spa style app. Like it'll have some uh, interactivity, some tabs. You can tab around. There we go. So we have a home page, a counter, fetch data page. I can use the back and forward buttons in the browser so I can uh, do client side um, routing. Uh, all of those navigations are actually being intercepted in the browser by Blazor and then handled in the browser without the requests ever coming to the server. The home page just has a little bit of static HTML, nothing too exciting there. The counter has this button that if I click, the count goes up and there's no page refresh happening there. It's all happening like a client side app uh, would, would normally work. And then we have fetch data and fetch data is conveniently enough showing a table of weather forecast <laughs> data. Now how, how is this working? How is this possible? There's no JavaScript in my project. Well, let's F12 and look at what is going on in the browser dev tool. So I'm going to refresh so we can see the network traffic. And if you look here, we can see that there's not much being downloaded. It's only about 400 kilobytes of stuff. But if we look a little more carefully, we see there's a WebSocket connection being set up between the browser and the server. That WebSocket connection is being used to send all the UI events to our components that are running server side, which then executes the components, figures out how the UI should be updated, and sends the updates back down to the browser to be applied to the actual DOM. So that's how it's working. And we can, we can see that in action. Let's look at the WebSocket connection a little more closely. We'll clear all the messages that have been sent so far. And I'm just going to click. You see that? See the binary messages flying? That's UI events being sent and UI updates being processed. That's how that's all, uh, that's all happening. Now let's go look at how the code is actually implemented for that counter component. Here it is. It's a Razor syntax, a combination of HTML and C Sharp. We can see it's routable because it has this at page directive at the top to say that the route for this component is slash counter. We have some normal HTML markup and then we're using Razor syntax to, to render the value of the current count. We also have a button which has an on click handler. Normally this would have to be JavaScript, but here it's C sharp. We're pointing to a C sharp method that whenever time the button is clicked, the count gets updated, the component re renders, and that's how you see those updates on the screen. Now, 
each of these razor files is actually compiled into a, just a normal .NET class that captures the rendering logic from, uh, uh, from the, the .razor file. And those component classes can be compiled into .NET assemblies. They can be then shared on, on NuGet as NuGet packages. You can build reusable component libraries. That's how those component vendors we showed, showed earlier can actually sh you know, have these components that we can actually just drop into our apps. That's right. And it makes your life so much more productive. You can just grab existing components and go. Let me show you how that's done, how you can build your own um, component class libraries. I'm going to add a new project to this solution. And this time, instead of a Blazor app, I'm going to pick a Razor class library. Now, what is that? Well, a Razor class library is actually just a normal .NET standard class library, but it's been set up to also be able to compile .razor files, to, to compile Razor components. Here we have a Razor component that's in the new class library. It's pretty simple. It's just a div. But it does have some styling. And this is interesting. The, the project has this www root folder with a couple of static files. It's got a styles.css. It's got a background image that's also used. This is a new feature in ASP.NET Core, in .NET Core 3.0, where your class libraries can carry static files that then are made available to the application when the project is referenced or when the NuGet package is referenced. So I'm going to add a reference to that class library, like so. So I can use that component. Now, to make the, these files available in my app, I do have to add a, a, a link to the, to the styles that I want. And we use a simple convention to do that. I'm going to copy this existing uh, link, and I'm just going to update it. So the convention is it's uh, underscore content is the, the, the prefix, and then the name of the class library. So Razor class library one, and then the path to the file that you want. So styles.css, and that's all you got to do. Now we can use our component in our app. So let's just start typing here. Component one, I think is the name. Yep, there's IntelliSense. Let's close that out. We save. Let's go back to the browser. You can see that the browser already knows that the app has been changed. We just refresh. And so we can hopefully see the changes on the home page. Aha, there is our styled component that came from that component class library. So easy, so simple. So that gives us hopefully the basics. Let's now go build that weather app. I've already started it over here in this solution. So if we go into the Blazor folder, I'm going to set the Blazor server version of this app as the startup project. There we go. Now, this, this Blazor app is a little bit interesting in that there's not much in it. Like It actually doesn't have like hardly any Razor files in the app project like hardly at all. Um, that's because it references this Blazor uh, Weather Core project down below. That's a Razor class library that contains all the components that's used by the app. And I'll explain why we did that in just a bit. But you can look in here and see there's the forecast.razor page, and there's all the Razor syntax that renders the app. Let's go ahead and run this and see what the app looks like. This app uh, borrows the same beautiful design that James used for the mobile application. There it is. So it looks pretty good. We got the current temperature. That's all working. Now let's look at the code and see how that is done. At the top of this page, it's got a route, just like before. It also is injecting an iWeather forecast service. That's the same gRPC-based service that James used in his mobile app. Same code, like Power same library. Net. Yep. All the code runs everywhere, browser, mobile, desktop. Anywhere you want. And then we've got the Razor markup that's just rendering out the, the, the DOM elements for the, for the page. Down below in this code block, here's a um, component lifecycle event that fires when the component has rendered. And this is kicking off this get weather updates async process, which is in this method down here. Here you see that async for each loop that we saw Same before. Loop we've seen before. So it's getting the live updates from the server. We should be able to see that in the app. If I uh, let's zoom in here. So 40, 45. Yep. So the, the ticks are coming in from the yep, I can see it updating. All right, great. Now, we're missing an ability to actually change the, uh, the temperature units. Uh, let's go ahead and fix that. Uh, I already wrote a little temperature unit picker component. It's another .razor file in the class library. It's just a div. Let's expand it again. It's just a div that has an on-click handler that when it's clicked, it will toggle the units from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And then it has this parameter, temperature unit changed, so it can let the parent component know. So now we just need to use that. So let's go back to our weather forecast page. After the temperature, let's add the temperature unit picker. And we're going to at bind the temperature unit from that component to the temperature unit field in my page. And that's all we should need to do. I'm going to control F5 again, not control F4. <laughs> I don't even know what control F4 does. I was maybe search or something. All right, there we go. So we're up and running. And now we've got this little widget down here by the temperature. I can click on it, and you can see the temperature automatically updates between Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now, that's a Blazor server version of the app. But one of the 
cool things about Blazor. I'm going to stop you and say we're going to we're going to stop on the Blazor stuff, and but we can quickly we, we, we can quickly talk about the WebAssembly thing. So, um, I'll try. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You, you, um, basically, WebAssembly allows you to take these same applications and actually build them where all the code runs on the browser, not on the server. This is the same app. Same components, it's just instead of running in a Blazor server app on the server, this is all executing client side in the browser. There's the WebAssembly file coming down with the app. So you can host your app on the server or on the client and take advantage of both sides of the wire. Cool. I am super excited with this Blazor stuff. This is like, you know, all my ASP.NET knowledge now lets me build spy applications without using any JavaScript at all if I want. So super cool, Dan. Full stack web development with .NET. Okay, let's switch back to the slides real quick. Um, I want to talk about one more big thing, uh, machine learning. Uh, we introduced ML.NET uh, at Build. That's May of this year, uh, 1.0 that just shipped. Um, and I'm just going to quickly talk about it, and we're going to bring Bree up and show a couple demos. Uh, the whole idea behind uh, ML.NET is if you're a C-sharp developer, you don't want to have to go out and use some other technology or some other language to go and build machine learning into your applications. And so you can build uh, ML models and stuff directly in C-sharp or F-sharp without having to go anywhere else. Um, we also know that it's hard to actually build, you know, machine learning models. Um, and so we have an awesome preview tool uh, called Model Builder that you can use to actually uh, just point at some of your data, tell it what you want to predict, and it'll actually go and write all the code and models for you. Bree's going to show that. And then finally, we want to make sure that anything that we do in ML.NET, uh, it can be extended with all the ML buzzwords you've heard like TensorFlow and stuff. So what I'm going to do next is bring Bree up on stage. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a, yeah, come on. We're going to build a machine learning application that does weather as well. Yes, we are. Um, so if we take a look, we still have Dan's Blazor app up on here. Um, but what we're going to do is actually make this app smarter using ML.NET. Uh, all it does is it right now is it pulls weather data from uh, from Glenn's microservice that's hosted in Azure Kubernetes. But we're going to use machine learning to take images from around the city and actually predict if it's uh, sunny, cloudy, or rainy. So it's going to predict the weather. Because we all know that the weather's not always accurate. You're better off going right. and looking yourself to see if it's actually doing right, something. Right, exactly. So we'll close out of all these over here. All right. So if we go back to, let's see. The forecast.razor that we saw before. All right, so Dan talked a little bit about uh, components, which are just UI elements that you can have in your Blazor applications, and I created one of those for the machine learning. And I just called it ML Weather Cam. That's just going to go right below uh, the weather data that we saw before. And then um, what this does is it, if we look at this ML Weather Cam.razor right here, there's going to be three buttons that are going to link to three separate photos, which are then going to be put into this classify weather method. And if we go so I'm going to go to the app. It's going to yep. show me a couple of pictures that we mm -hmm. got from cams around the, the area. And right. then it's going to tell us kind of what it thinks those cams are showing us, whether right. it's rainy or sunny or, or whatnot. Exactly. So here you can see there's nothing really implemented right now. We just have it returning a string. So if we go ahead and run this real quick. Give it a second. And we'll see that new component added on there. It's just when you uh, click on it. Oh, you know what? Actually, we're going to try it on the server version instead because that's where it's implemented. So let's <laughs> retry that. <laughs> Dan caught you up there. Yeah, he really did. He end. really did. Uh, let me try this again. So we're going to rebuild our solution. And it'll take just a second. Just I want to show you that it's implemented without the machine learning. So right, we'll start without machine, machine learning. Yeah, uh, exactly. Run the application. We'll show the pictures. Yeah. Um, and then we'll run Model Builder to go and create the actual model for us. Right. Um, exactly. And so, shouldn't have rebuilt the full solution, but <laughs> give it a second. It's a big solution. It actually. is. A, it's a big solution. Yeah. So, so one thing I should talk about is. Um, you know, while we have the solution, we're actually going to make this entire, all the demos we have today will be available on GitHub later today. Right, exactly. For anybody that watched the keynote can actually uh, uh, do this themselves. Right. Ah, I um, see pictures. And so here are the three pictures that I was talking about. Here's that new component. And of course, it's just returning the same text every time. 
So to add machine learning, um, we're just going to use Model Builder, uh, which is a UI tool in Visual Studio. It's just an extension that you can download. Once you download that extension, you add machine learning. And there's a variety of uh, scenarios here that you can see, like sentiment analysis, price prediction. But we're going to do image classification because we want to predict the weather in images. So then we'll choose our training data, which is how you create the machine learning model. In this case, uh, I've already uh, put it in the format that it needs to be with three different labels here. And we can actually see once we choose that, that I have my images here, a preview of my images for cloudy, rainy, and sunny. So you gave it a bunch of images to learn from. Right. Uh, right. And I'm going to have it train for about 90 seconds because it's a small data set. With larger data sets, you want it to train for a little bit longer. So this, this, this whole tool kind of makes me laugh. I remember a year or two ago, uh, we were building a demo in the team. Called, it, was a, it was called GitHub Classifier. And what GitHub Classifier did is it basically looked at the issues that were being filed in our GitHub repos and would automatically classify them to the right places. Um, it's kind of a bot. Um, I remember sitting with my team, and um, I was looking at the code, and I'm like, I, I, I don't know if I'd ever be able to write that code. Um, and this is kind of the genesis of the model builder thing. I couldn't figure out how to write the code. And then the next thing was, um, I remember asking the team, well, how did you choose the algorithm? And the answer kind of was, well, we tried this one, and it seemed to work. Um, and to me, model builder is like, taking that to the next step further, where you basically, instead of doing that, uh, give me a data file of existing data, uh, run this tool on it. It will try, I think it's doing it right now, it's trying all the different uh, algorithms we have in ML.NET, um, and will uh, write the right. code for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're making ML where I can use the code. Right, yeah, so building and fine tuning uh, the performance of a machine learning algorithm can be really difficult, especially if you don't have that machine learning knowledge. So what Model Builder does is use automated machine learning, or AutoML for short, uh, to explore different algorithms and settings to give you the best model based on your scenario and your data. So it's, it's really, really cool because you don't have to have that machine learning knowledge. And as well, you're showing the graphical version of this inside of Visual right. Studio, but if I am on a Mac or on a Linux machine, mm -hmm. I can also drop to command line mm -hmm. and run the same tool that you're, you're running with uh, in, inside of Visual Studio on all those platforms as well. Right, exactly. So if you, you don't use Visual Studio, you can actually use this uh, ML.NET CLI in any command prompt, which is really nice. Um, so it's done training. We're going to head over to the Evaluate screen. It actually found this one model here, which uses a ResNet neural network architecture uh, for that image classification. And we'll move on here. And so what's really nice is once you have your trained model, you can add your projects. And if we zoom in here, give it a second. You can see that there's this console app here, uh, which is actually where the model training code is. Then you have your model consumption code and your actual serialized zip file, which is the model. So if we come back out here, and now if we go back to Model Builder, you can see it gave you the code for consumption right here. All you have to do is copy this code and go back to our weather classifier. We'll uncomment the namespace. It, model Builder actually adds the reference to the model for you. And right here, so we've created our input. We're going to set the file path here to full path. And then we're going to actually load this into here and return result.prediction. And so actually, we're going to add the reference here because I think it was added to the wrong. No, nope, it's there. Let's see what it's giving us here. Oh, here we go. So we've got our weather service ml.model. Oh, what we have to do is actually, I think I called it on the wrong one. The wrong project? Yeah, the wrong project. It actually needs to be called on this project. So whichever project you add machine learning to, it'll add that reference to automatically. But since I did it on the wrong one, we're just going to add the model here. And then we'll. I saw one's go go away. Yep. Inputs. Oh. So then, sorry, it's a mouse I'm not really used to here. So we're going to do input dot image source equals full path, and then we'll be able to debug that. Awesome. A second. All right, 
So now we can see that it detects this Ooh, image. I saw it say cloudy so when we've got CenturyLink Field is cloudy. Paramount Theater is looking a little bit rainy, and Golden Gardens Park is looking sunny. So in less than five minutes, we were able to use ML.NET and Model Builder to add machine learning to this Blazor application, which is really really cool. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the slides, and uh, we'll talk about uh, IoT. Uh, so IoT is kind of a new space in .NET. Uh, .NET Core kind of enabled this by being able to run on different platforms and architectures. And so the big thing here is you can run .NET Core on uh, all these small devices, Raspberry Pis, including all of .NET. You can run ASP.NET on these things. Uh, we have a GPIO library for reading and, and writing data to some cool hardware that Richard's going to show us. Um, and you can actually deploy these applications to IoT either directly on the device or using a container on the device. Um, so let's switch over here and bring Rich on, and let's talk about IoT and .NET. Hey, Scott. So this is more of a show and tell type of uh, setup today. So um, we, we have a Raspberry Pi right here. So this is a Raspberry Pi 3, actually. And uh, it's got this hat on it. Um, sometimes they're called shields, but this is, this is a hat or a bonnet. And this is controlling this um, set of LED matrices. So actually, there's four of them here. It's, it's really hard to tell because I did a, such a good job making this setup. But there's actually four of these. Um, and it's all C-sharp code that is running this from, from top to bottom. And so the, the libraries that we built actually are able to figure out like the address translation to deal with the fact that there's four of these. And they're kind of like in this setup. And so it's kind of cool. We've got um, a message here about .NET Conf. That's kind of one row. Then we have this other one with the time. Then we built a um, analog clock. An analog clock, and you can see this isn't an image. This is actually a code-driven. I'm watching the second hand go around <laughs> in, in real time. It's amazing. Yeah. So this is a, this is this is how you're staying on track, right? Yes. <laughs> so this is actually a, a kind of a canvas, and then um, it's actually raining in Seattle. This won't be much of a surprise you're to you. You're calling the same service that we showed everywhere yeah, else, right? Exactly. The Raspberry, Raspberry Ex Pi. Exactly, and then so it's it's showing it's raining. So. Really what this is demonstrating is um, this device is like really low powered compared to, you know, the like Intel X64 blah, blah, blah machines that we've been used to. And it's showing that, yep, you can write C Sharp, run it on here, and it's capable of like doing a lot of things at once. That's the cool part about C Sharp in .NET is you can actually run it on what, ARM32, ARM64, but if you want, you can also run it on the big Intel CPUs as well. Yeah, and, uh, and it's all the same. The other thing is um, because it's all C-sharp, it means that you can actually use the C-sharp debugger that you're used to using. A lot of the other solutions out there depend on native libraries. And some of those are GPL, ours is MIT, so it's super um, attractive to people that work in this kind of ecosystem. Cool. Well, I, I'm still super excited about this because we never could have done this five years ago. Oh, yeah, totally. This, this is definitely new. So but we're, I'm really happy, happy about awesome. it, too. Thank Let's you. go back to the slides real quick. And um, I want to talk about something really cool. Um, .NET Core is all open source. And um, even though it's open source, we actually want to consume some of the open source libraries. So there's a couple of references you've heard today, like gRPC. gRPC is an open source project. And we, Microsoft, have been contributing to that, to that project. Our engineers are working on that project to make sure that the C-sharp support there is first class. Um, at the same time, I mentioned earlier, Identity Server. Uh, Identity Server is an open source project that helps you add uh, authentication to your APIs in .NET Core. Um, we are actually contributing to Identity Server. We actually are helping uh, fund them as a uh, sponsor of their project, giving them money. Um, you know, gRPC, we're giving them code. Identity Server, we're giving them money uh, via GitHub. And then also Swashbuckle, which is a, a common library for building uh, Swagger uh, for .NET Core projects. If you want to, if you want to use uh, any of our uh, REST stuff, we we can generate REST endpoints the same way we generated those gRPC endpoints. To do that, you have to have a, a library like Swashbuckle. And so I'm happy to announce that we're also helping fund them as well. .NET 5. So we just shipped .NET Core 3, and of course the team is super excited. We're working on .NET Core 3.1 right now, but I want to briefly talk about .NET 5 too. So you know, after .NET Core 3, the next big thing is. Uh, you know, we talked about Xamarin and we talked about .NET Core. What if we put all that together into a single framework? And so .NET 5 is the genesis of this. The next, the next iteration of .NET will be .NET 5. And the idea here is all the runtimes collapse, so we have one common set of runtimes. We have one BCL that sits on top of that, 
and then we have all the app models on top of it. And so in the .NET 5 wave, there'll just be one .NET, not uh, multiple .NETs. Um, let's talk about our schedule. So we just shipped uh, .NET Core 3 today. Uh, .NET Core 3.1 is going to ship uh, in late November, early December. That'll be our LTS. That's our one if you want long-term support. Uh, but we're going to go way beyond that. We want to make .NET predictable. So you can see here now, .NET 5 will ship next November. .NET 6 will ship the November afterwards. Uh, so on and so on and so on. Each of these .NETs, um, every other year will be an LTS. So it's very clear which ones are long-term supported and which ones are faster. But we're trying to make it easier for you to consume .NET and understand the schedule. I do want to do one quick thing. I'm going to grab my laptop, slide it over here. Um, I thought I would do one demo of some of the tech that we have coming in .NET 5. Um, and so Dan showed the Blazor app, uh, Ali showed the desktop app, Jan James showed the, the, the Xamarin app, and uh, Bree showed the ML app. Well, we want to take this step, this step even, even further. So we're going to switch to my laptop here. Let me jump out of presenter mode. my laptop back, and I want to show a preview of one of the things we're thinking about in .NET 5. Um, so I'm going to run that same Blazor app that Dan showed, but now what I've done is I've actually wrapped it in an Electron shell. Uh, Electron is the technology we use to take, make things like Visual Studio Code run uh, on the desktop. And so now you see that same exact web weather application running. It's, it's, it's a Blazor application, so it's web, but it's now running in a desktop window. It's got file menus. I can do file and exit. Uh, this is one of the examples of the technology we'll bring uh, in the .NET 5 wave. Um, so I want to close with um, one thing here, which is um, we have an awesome unified platform. You can build every type of application on .NET Core. Um, my advice to customers today with the shipping of .NET Core 3, if you're building new applications, Build them on top of .NET Core 3. It now has all the capabilities that should be important for modern applications. If you have existing applications, you likely should keep them on .NET Framework. There's no uh, reason to move them off of .NET Framework. .NET Framework is going to be supported forever. So new applications on .NET Core 3, leave your existing applications where they are. Everything that I'm showing here is downloadable today. Um, and I want to thank you everybody very much. Go get the bits. Um, and build some new applications on .NET Core. Thank you very much. Hey, hey guys. All right, welcome to .NET Comp 2019. Woo! That's exciting. That was an awesome Donna keynote, Torch right? Woo. Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to let you guys know a little bit about the format of this conference. We're going to have a super awesome time for you. Um, if you look on the party page, the .NET Conf website, .netconf.net slash party, there are two virtual attendee parties happening. These are all sponsored by our amazing sponsors of the .NET Conf itself here. They are giving away over 40 prizes, Xboxes, uh, Surface Goes, a bunch of Amazon gift cards. The attendee parties, one is after the show today, and mm -hmm. one is on Wednesday at 4 a.m. our time, um, so we can hit all the time zones. So you can play, answer trivia questions, and if you really want to get involved and engage and watch the video, Jeff's going to be back there with the partners, uh, Twitch TV, yep. Hack Visual Studio. Um, so that'll be fun. It's going to be a ton of fun. I think yeah. that's fun. And then the other thing we're doing, the new this year, is a tre technical treasure hunt. Okay, so 10 of our partners have created these technical challenges for you where you got to go figure out answers. They're going to give you clues throughout the day. So watch the uh, .NET Foundation um, Twitter handle yep. and the hashtag .NET Conf. Our partners will give you secret clues. Um, watch this page. We'll give you all the URLs to hit, so if you want to try and figure them out. Um, read the rules, okay? So what you do is you'll need a Twitch account and you'll whisper to the Twitch bot your answer and it will let you know if you got it right or not. If you get them all right, you're entered to win for a really big grand prize. A now, lot anybody, of cool little yeah. puzzles and stuff. Oh yeah, they're really, really cool neat. challenges yeah. from our partners, so that's actually pretty awesome. Um, yeah, so watch that. Also, uh, I wanted to say our local events. We now have 217 local events, and I think there's like 40 watch parties going on right now. It's amazing. So, like, if yeah. you are, if you guys are having a watch party right now, make sure you take a picture of your event. 
hashtag.net conf. We'll get it on the tag board yeah. here. Okay, yeah. so um, that will be awesome. So a lot of these actually are our .NET Foundation meetups, right, John? They are. They are. That's right. Yeah. Um, so .NET Foundation meetups have grown. They've they've just grown like crazy. So we're at uh, 314 worldwide now, 62 countries, which is so cool. That's amazing. Um, I've got a link here too. Um, you can join these. There's a link on this where you can join the, the meetups and we'd love to have you. So this is a great way where you can get involved locally. And like Beth said, tweet your tweet stuff with .NET Conf and, and we'll you know, post your, your pictures. Um, .NET Foundation's been really busy lately. We've got, uh, we recently this year, we launched our community uh, community elections. So it's open membership and an open uh, vote for our board of directors. So we had a great turnout for the election. Our, our new board of directors, when they uh, started up, we met and we said, you know, what is some stuff we want to do? What are, what are some things we want to focus on? And Beth, you're one of the board of director members here. I am. Um, so we, one of the things we decided to do was form some action groups. And these action groups are like, hey, here's some stuff we really want to focus on and get done. Um, and then as part of this, we make it so that uh, members can join these action groups as well. So they can volunteer, get involved, and you know, help get stuff done, right? So some of these, uh, the marketing communication one, we've moved to a, uh, you know, it's all GitHub pull requests. People can submit their news items. Uh, project support, we've moved over to a Kanban board that's open. Um, one, oh, and the outreach team, um, Sarah Chips led a, a call with people around the world and we had, you know, we had all these people telling us how we can expand the reach of opensource.net. It's actually been really fun trying to pull together a committee and volunteers it's and that great. sort of stuff. It's so, and yeah. expanding out from this tiny little team to like this worldwide group. One that I'm really excited to talk about today is the technical oversight group. So when we first met, we uh, the t the team, uh, especially like John Skeet and Ben Adams and Orrin Novotny, they were saying, you know, there's some stuff we could do to make to just improve the project ecosystem, to make it so that you can depend on projects, they'll stay around, um, that there'll be a little more structure to them. So I'm really excited to announce today that we've got three new programs launching under this. So one is a maturity model, and I'll dive into that in a second. That really defines these quality levels. We're also announcing to support that some training and support and a project forge. And that project forge is, is focused at identifying some kind of key strategic areas for things like, shouldn't there be a library? Shouldn't there be a project for this? And then dive in and do it. So very cool. Yeah, this project maturity ladder is it's totally opt-in. If it doesn't fit your project, totally fine. But if it does, this can really open up some things. So uh, we've started, you know, up till now, we've really, where we've been at for our, our projects in .NET Foundation has been kind of in the two and three level here. So it's been, you know, you'd contribute your IP, we'd say, here's some general best practices, and we'd support the project, but it's, you're kind of on your own. It also was difficult for a project to join. It could kind of take a while. I see. So what we've done now is we've added this easier level, this incubator level, and this is a really easy on-ramp, make it quick for a project to join. Not a lot of legal paperwork. It's just kind of like, hey, we'll hook you up with a mentor. We'll help market you. Then as you move up, we're, we're adding in some structure around things like uh, you know, bringing in some basic security practices at level two. Level three, really focusing on things like continuity and signed packages. Make it easy for, for enterprise to trust you, you know, um, and for, other, for interdependencies between li libraries. And then finally, at level four is this trustworthy project, and this is actually built from source on certified build infrastructure. Okay. So, yeah, we, you like know. Like .NET Core is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And so, you know, we've, we've got a blog post going through this. There's actually a lot of information here. We've got a repo that's live today with tons of information on this. Um, also, um, as you mentioned, uh, the .NET team is involved. We're also, we've got several pilot projects. So we worked with, we reached out to a lot of our kind of top community projects and we said, you know, what, what uh, would you like to get involved? So they worked with us to kind of look at our draft of the proposal and get it right, you know? So, so we're really excited about this. We're working with uh, Dapper Identity Server, Mini Profiler, um, Stack Exchange Redis. What's that? Okay, <laughs> Newtonsoft, Jason, and, and then the .NET team, like you said. So they're actually building on the, on the certified infrastructure. Um, awesome. So yeah, cool. And also, uh, let me see, am I still, what am I doing here? Great. 
Nothing's happening. There it is. Um, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise we've also, not. under the .NET Foundation, we've got a corporate sponsor program. So we launched that in December. We've got several corporate sponsors. Um, so in December, we added on Pivotal, Progress Telerik, and Insight. Right. And um, so these are, these are companies that, you know, their business is invested in open source .NET to the point that they really, they're chipping in financially. They're getting involved in supporting things. Super excited today to announce that AWS is joining. So AWS is a corporate sponsor of the .NET Foundation, um, and we're just so happy to have them join. So we, we've got it's awesome to have them on board and helping there. Absolutely. absolutely, and this is something you know where they can help. They can be in, involved and help review things. They've got some great uh, .NET insight. They've been shipping for for over ten years, you know, and so it's, it's pretty significant. We now have all three major cloud vendors as sponsors, corporate sponsors of the .NET Foundation. That's pretty huge. Absolutely. So I think what you see with this is you know huge investment from Microsoft and .NET right. and the community, the, the entire you know worldwide community with the meetups and stuff, and then also the corporate sponsorship shows just support all over the place. It's great to see .NET growing like this. Absolutely, and so now we want people to become a member of the foundation, right? Absolutely, and yeah. it, You don't really have to be like a super duper coder. You can become a member even if you're just like contribute to docs, run a meetup, you, yep. know, you know, help out the community in any way, right? Yeah, so there, there's information here on this become a member page and it really is something where, you know, if you've contributed, you know, we've got people that have contributed just a few lines to docs or they've spoken at their local meetup you know, like done a, a short little presentation. If you haven't even, if you're not at that level, let us know and we'll tell you how you can get involved. Gotcha. So, That's and this, so cool. becoming a member is kind of the first step because then we can get you involved with these action groups, action groups that are doing things like that. You know, that maturity ladder that I talked about, that's going to take some work to get that all set up. It's exciting though, right? It's a right. new opportunity and so this is your ground floor to get in. So. And so like, we're actually all open all on GitHub, our discussions, everything that we're doing like yep. around the, cause those committees. So as you, when you join, become a member, you can actually contribute to just the discussions as well. Exactly. You know, I mean, would love to have You know, can you help review a project's uh, right. you know, checklist? Well, things like these, things, you know, right? Can, can, you, can you review the membership applications? Sure. Right? There's a lot of well, work it, to do. But it, it's exciting right? because it has a huge worldwide impact, right? right. So things like that, um, that newsletter, right? Moving that to something where anyone in the world can submit a news item, and as soon as we open that up, our newsletter got so much better, right? right? It's, exactly. It's a lot of so good we're stuff. open sourcing basically, our, or opening up the way that we run the foundation the process, to all of our yeah. members, and that's what these action committees and groups are about. So yeah. I'm really excited about that. All right, so um, right now we're going to get started with some amazing sessions, all right? These are going to be, we have like 78 sessions for you over the course of three days. It's absolutely insane. So in order to make these sessions awesome, we want you to ask uh, your questions on Twitter, okay? Mm -hmm. Just use the hashtag .NET Conf because this year we have some amazing live in-studio hosts and this year we've got Kendra Havens and Scott Hanselman. <gasps> Take it away guys, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you Beth and John, yeah, we're, got, we're hosting. This is our Twitter board, so we'll see everything that you submit and be able to read those out to our speakers and answer them. Yep, so make sure that you uh, tag all of your tweets with hashtag .NET Conf, and we'll go ahead and bring them up on the big board here. You can see that folks are doing viewing parties. Ooh. Uh, so some huge nerds there. Uh, here we go, some folks in, uh, in India are doing a live streaming party as well. So I'd love to see photographs, pictures of your, of your parties, of your viewing parties. We have folks all over the place. We've got... We got some pizza at X Spirit. <laughs> So I want to see photographs. I want to see photographs of you and your friends and your coworkers and colleagues all checking out .NET Conf Live and hashtag those things. And of course, questions. Like in a few minutes, we're going to have Mads Torgerson talking about C Sharp 8. Uh, if you want to have live questions from, from Mads, those questions will show up on the board and Kendra and I will make sure that they get answered. Yep. Uh, one other thing I want to call out, and maybe they'll put those up on the board for us, is some new videos that we did as well. So when the fun and excitement of .NET Conf 
uh, wears off with over 80 different uh, videos yeah, and sessions. Yeah, it's a lot to take in in one day. We got together with our friends and we put up some great stuff on YouTube. If you go to dot.net slash videos, mm -hmm. there's in fact over 80, I think something like 85 new videos that are um, going to show people how to do .net, how to do C Sharp, how to do ASP.NET, ML, desktop, all kinds of stuff. Maybe our friends that are running the board here will send me a picture of that tweet. I tweeted it on my Twitter. Uh, but you can check that out at dot.net slash videos, and uh, all of those are available. Let's see what we got here. And then we're going to bring that up for me. I don't see them yet. This is the great thing about live television. Yeah, we wanted to share that tweet with you. I want to share that you, tweet with so you. Refresh. But that's at dot.net slash videos, all of that. And then everything that we're doing today, even though it's live, it's recorded, isn't it? Right? So, oh, yes. I can click this button here. Oh, there we go. I forgot that's about that one. That's what I got to learn to do. That's, that's my bad. That's what we should have been doing. <laughs> see, look at this. Oh, hang on. Hackerspace Mumbai. Nice. Ooh. What else we got here? There's some enthusiasm here <laughs> about .NET. Yeah. A lot of people excited to be a .NET developer. It's, oh, look at this. There's that. There's our folks in Bengaluru. She, she's the next three. See, see what's here. Oh, what else you got here? Do I see? There's so many tweets. I'm actually not even finding our tweets. Right. See, folks are just bringing them in. Okay, well, they're going to come in faster than I can deal with them, but we're going to have all kinds of information about .NET and the future of .NET, and I think that right now we're going to be jumping over to Mads Torgerson, who's going to do actually a two-part session. Yeah, all C Sharp 8 goodness. I'm excited. All right, <laughs> let's jump over to Mads, and we'll see you on the big board soon. Hey, I'm Mads Torgerson, and uh, I get to design C Sharp for a living, so that's pretty cool. I'll be doing the first of these two sessions about C Sharp 8. Uh, the other session is actually going to be Bill Wagner, um, who writes about C Sharp for a living. Um, so we're both uh, deeply involved there. Um, there's a bunch of new features in C Sharp 8, so that's why we kind of cheated a little bit here and got ourselves two of these short sessions. But um, this first one here is going to be devoted exclusively to, um, to null. So this is going to be 25 minutes talking about nothing, essentially. Um, Null is one of these things that we've learned to live with, but we aren't really super happy. Um, it's been an object oriented programming forever. Null is actually about 53 or 54 years old. Um, and um, the problem with it is that it poses as an object. You can always get null, uh, but um, you never know where it's coming from. And eventually, you accidentally dereference it, and it'll blow up. Um, so it's kind of like this black hole. You circle it, but when, once you're beyond the event horizon, you know, you get the, uh, uh, you, you get the, um, the gist here. So I'm going to switch into uh, Visual Studio, and we're going we're gonna to blow some things up. So here's an absolutely uh, innocent looking little program. I create a person, I call a method, and I print out the result of that method. That method gets uh, the length of the uh, person's middle name and, uh, and returns it. So it's absolutely straightforward code. Nothing to see here would pass any code review. Um, but of course, uh, if we run it, um, then uh, we, uh, we wait for a while, and then we get a nice little explosion, right? Because it turns out that middle name was null, but we were dereferencing it. And at least now debugger tools can tell us what it was that was null. But it doesn't tell us where the null came from. Why is it there? Should it have been there? Was it my fault? Was it the API's fault, the person API that I was calling? Um, that's all really muddled and unclear. And so that is what the feature is for that we call nullable reference types in C Sharp 8. It's one of those features that is about telling you new things about your existing programs. It's telling you, uh, it's giving you new warnings where your behavior isn't what we could call null safe. So it's, it's attempting to catch places where you do things that might are likely to lead to null reference exceptions. Since it's adding new warnings, it's a feat that's sort of like a breaking change if all of a sudden we start adding warnings to existing code. So don't do that automatically. It's a feature that has to be turned on. And the, um, the most sort of sweeping way of turning it on, I'm going to turn it on here for uh, the, the person library. Well, I'm going to go into Solution Explorer and turn it on. I just go into uh, the project file. There's this thing. I, I pre-added this thing. This nullable element here, and it's set to disable. And I'm, gonna, I'm now going to enable the feature. But it's disabled by default. So you have to go do this manually. Now that I do that, let's go look at this person class. It has you know, straightforward auto properties, and it has this constructor I was calling with a first and a last name. 
And what we see now is that now it gets a warning after I turn the feature on. And the warning says that the non-nullable property middle name is uninitialized. So what does that mean? Well, it means that essentially it means that it could apparently now it considers middle name to be non-nullable. In other words, reference types as we know and love them uh, are now considered to be non-nullable. They're not supposed to have null in them. And it catches the fact that since it's, it comes pre-initialized to null, we don't change that to something non-null. We could, of course, initialize it. Kind of cheekily, we could initialize it to null. And then that warning would go away. It goes away. But now we get another warning saying, hey, you can't assign null in there. Nice try. And so we're faced with this design question, actually. This forces a design question that we probably we should have asked ourselves earlier, but had no way of expressing in the, in the language. Should these strings actually be null or not? Like, is it part of the API to handle that they're null, or is it not? Now, sort of by default, the feature is saying they're not. They're not supposed to be null. Uh, but what if I want them to be null? What if, it, what if it makes sense for middle names to be null? Actually, you know, it probably makes sense for all of these to be null. Um, uh, but we're just going to do the middle name today. Um, you know, symmetry. Um, uh, um, exercise for the reader, but I can put a question mark on string and it's now a nullable reference type, which is the name of the feature as well. I'm signaling that, that middle names can be string or null. It can be, uh, they can actually be null. I'm signaling this in my public API and I absolve myself from having to make sure it's not null and I get no more warnings in the API here. So now I've come clean with my API. I've told the consumers what's, uh, what's null and what isn't. And now if I go back to the program here as a consumer of the API, I now get a warning saying, hey, this thing here, you're dereferencing it even though it might be a null reference. Well, why might it be a null reference? Well, that's because the local variable is actually now inferred to be of type string question mark because the middle name probably returns string question mark, nullable string. Okay, so we're propagating this potential nullness through the system. And now I get a chance so now the API is saying, hey, it's your problem to deal with nulls, but I'm also getting help from the language dealing with the nulls. I get advanced warning instead of luckily catching it um, maybe um, from an exception that gets thrown before I accidentally ship to customers. So what can I do? Well, what are the usual things I would do about a null? I should just do the same things here. So if middle is null, this is how I would usually write it, you know, return uh, zero. And what you see is that the warning goes away now. Actually, a uh, little aside here, um, as of patterns in C Sharp 7, I prefer to say middle is null because that checks for null even when you've overridden the uh, equality operator, um, which wouldn't necessarily work otherwise. So if the middle is null, return zero. Otherwise, return middle.length. Now the warning went away, and that's because the compiler understands that if we get to this point in the code, at this point, middle will not be null. And you just checked, and if it was null, you went down a different branch. Um, so that's doing essentially what we call a flow analysis, which is um, you know, potentially pretty advanced. It will follow the different branches of your code, and it will track in all these different places where, uh, where nulls may be and where they may not be. It's kind of similar to definite assignment analysis, which is already in the um, in the uh, language, but um, again, tracking the state of a variable as you go through. And actually, it's a bit smarter than just tracking the locals and uh, parameters here. Um, if we go and sort of cut out the middleman, if you will, um, inline the temporary variable, and we, we use person.middleName directly twice, you see that there's also no warning. If I remove the if here just to see, you get a warning on person.middleName potentially being null, but if I check that property of that parameter, then we track the state of that as well. So we track chains of properties and fields. Um, this is not actually entirely safe. Um, if you think about it, the, um, you know, somebody, if another thread is running, you know, they could change the middle name between the test and the, um, and the dereference here. Or, you know, I could call some innocuous looking method here that actually goes and changes the middle name behind the scenes or whatnot, and the compiler can't see it. So this is, uh, this is a bit dangerous, but 
the way we think about the nullable feature is it gives you warnings. Warnings are places where we warn you if we're pretty certain that you have a problem. And there's a lot of existing code out there that looks like this, that, that works just like this. And if we were to flag all of that with this feature, it would be useless. It would be impossible for you to upgrade your existing code to uh, use a nullable feature. So we give you a pass on this probably safe thing. And there are a couple of other places where um, you know, the feature isn't ironclad. It will let through things that could potentially be wrong and not give you warnings there. It's not a guarantee against null reference exceptions. It's just going to find you most of them. So that's good to know. But if you want to avoid that kind of situation, you can uh, write code that's sort of correct by construction. You can try to do that. Um, we had that local variable before. That's a good way of doing that. You can also um, uh, use things like um, the uh, question dot operator that, um, oh, not there, but here, um, that checks for null and only does the dereference if the thing wasn't null. Now, of course, we get an int question mark, but then we can use the null coalescing operator to take any nulls that come out of that and turn them into zero. So um, that's correct by construction in the sense that you only read the variable once and you don't depend on its state remaining the same from check to, to consumption. Uh, if you go back to this version here, um, another, um, another couple of ways that you can be correct by construction if we just go and, um, well, actually, let's look at what happens if you also had a nullable person coming in. Now we have two potentially nullable things. We could use the person question mark dot here in the, in the um, condition, and that actually checks that the person is not null and the middle name is not null. And sure enough, uh, you, you don't get any warnings down here. The compiler tracks that they're both not null. Whereas if that check hadn't been there, both would have been a problem. There's actually two sets of squiggles on top here. So um, let's go and invert, oh, wrong button. Let's go and invert the, uh, the condition here. Uh, I've got an invert if, and talk about what if I want to check that something isn't null rather than is null. Uh, so uh, the new pattern matching, the new features that are added to pattern matching actually help a bit here. Um, I don't have to write it like this with, you know, a not and a parenthesis here. Instead, there's a new pattern in town that I can use to check that something is not null. It looks like this. Um, so it sort of means is object. Think about is an object, is a thing, is something. So think about this as, as meaning something. That, uh, that means that if that thing is something, then, you know, um, go down the true branch. So uh, what's nice about that is we can actually name the something. So there's optionally you can give it a name in this pattern here, this something pattern. Um, we don't actually call it that, but I'll get back to that in a second. We give, it, we give the something a name that can be used in the true branch where it isn't null, and then we could say middle.length here. And again, we get no warnings because we are in the true branch. Um, we could also go a step further what this actually is, is a degenerate form of a new pattern, a recursive pattern called a property pattern. So a property pattern is one where you can drill, we check for null, but then we, you can drill down into uh, properties of the object that we're currently um, matching on, and then we can apply further patterns at the next level down. So this string here has a length, and I could just use a var pattern to grab that length into a local variable, and I could actually just return that local variable. So just return the length. Um, and now I don't need the middle anymore. So um, I'm, I'm using pattern matching here now to dig in and get the, in case everything is not null, I get the right thing out and return it. Of course, now I could easily turn this into a conditional expression and you know, it starts getting nice and you can make it an expression body method as well. So you, know, you can play with this, um, but the upshot is you can use these newfangled pattern-based uh, methods of null checking if you want to, and these features interoperate very well. The pattern matching, the question dot operator, um, and, the, and the nullable reference types. But if you just use the old-fashioned if, um, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and we will check your code as best we can. So um, that's sort of the upshot. That's that's the core of the of the nullable reference types language feature. You can um, you get um, warnings when you 
put null into non-nullable reference types. You can then annotate things to become nullable reference types, and then you get warnings when you uh, dereference those without a check, as in our code here. Now, there are a couple of refinements uh, that we've added to the feature. We found as we were annotating the core libraries, for instance, that there are places where you kind of want to know better than the compiler or help the compiler a little bit. There's actually a feature that we used to call the dammit operator, but we're not allowed to. It's the bang, the postfix uh, exclamation mark here, which means I know better than what you think about this expression here. So you might think that middle is null, but I as a programmer know better, so just shut up with your warnings. I think we call it the null ignoring operator or something instead. It's not, the, it's not um, exclamation mark dot there. Th those aren't a single operator. The exclamation mark is its own operator. And so you can just say, I know better. That would be really bad to do here because, and usually it's bad to do because usually you don't know better. You just think you do. So let's not use that one. But then, um, there are ways in which certain helper methods, for instance, they have special behavior around nulls that it would be really nice to communicate. So before, when I said, uh, when I said if something wasn't null here, or if something was null, I relied on the fact that the compiler could see that there was a null check. But what if that null check is inside of a helper method? For instance, what if we use string dot is null or empty to check whether this string is um, whether this string should just return zero as its length. Um, let's do that for a second. What we see is, um, well, we see that the, um, if string that is null or empty, oh, I should pass it now, an argument. Of course, uh, if the middle name uh, is, is not null or empty, returns zero. And what you see now is that the warning goes away. So somehow the compiler knows that this method, that when that method returns false, then the thing is not null. And the way it knows it is that it's annotated with a special attribute. So we have a, a handful of attributes that signal special null behavior that you can put on members and, um, and parameters and so on. In this case, uh, it's an attribute on the on the string question mark typed value parameter here that says that this thing is not null when the result of the method is false. And there's a little set of like 10 of them. You can read in the docs what they are. They can use to refine uh, your APIs if they have special null behavior. And we do that a lot around the core libraries uh, where um, a lot of utility methods are. I think it's probably going to be less common in, um, in uh, most other code actually. Uh, but here and there, it's really useful to, to tweak the nullability behavior that the compiler sees in the public API. So those are a couple of ways of tweaking. Now, I mentioned a couple times, you know, existing code. And when you have a feature that when you turn it on for existing code, it lights up with all these warnings for potentially a large, um, a large uh, project, for instance. It's not really feasible. It's, uh, to, to convert it all over in one go. Um, I think most people would find it a little daunting. You get like 10,000 warnings in, in an, on a large project um, and go and fix them all. And so you want to do it piecemeal. Uh, and the way you can do it piecemeal is that you can actually turn the, the nullable feature on and off at a file level as well. So I can say nullable as a, as a new directive in C Sharp. I can, I can say nullable disable. And now, for the rest of this file, the nullable feature is disabled. Now, you can see I also get a warning on the, uh, on the question mark here, because when I disable a feature, I don't get to uh, use nullable reference types in my, in my code. I could say, let's say that I wanted to. I wanted to annotate my library and give my consumers uh, good uh, nullable annotations, but I don't have the time to fix all the warnings that um, show up in my, um, in my internal implementations of it, I could disable just uh, the warnings. And um, let's actually, let's introduce a, ah, that's fine. I can disable uh, the warnings and uh, now the annotations are still allowed, uh, but warnings are turned off. I can also, conversely, I could disable just annotations and now I still get the warnings, but the public API is not affected. 
Um, and of course, I can do this not just at the top of the file, but I can do it anywhere in the file. So, so now the uh, warnings um, or the annotations rather are enabled until I get down here. And now after that, I'm no longer allowed to say put a question mark there. I start getting a warning for that. So this is a way that you can you can take chunks of like file by file or even uh, chunk by chunk of your files and get the nullable warnings and annotations handled for those bit by bit. You don't have to look at all the warnings at once. Speaking of adoption, I think that um, another feature, a feature that actually, or a property of this feature that is a little reminiscent of when we did async is that in order to make use of the feature, to make good use of the feature as like an end user, an app writer or something like that, you really rely on the libraries that, that you have a dependency on to adopt this feature also. Because if you interact with a library that didn't have the nullable feature on, then you won't get any warnings from interacting with that library. And only later when they do get around to adding these annotations, you start getting warnings maybe for any null unsafe use you have of that library. And so there's a bit of sort of an ecosystem adoption thing where this language feature, it, it's useful in and of itself, but it certainly gets more and more useful the more of the world uh, starts um, adopting it. And so in order to talk about that, let's go back to slides quickly here. Um, so essentially, what we want to suggest, and this is of course is up to you out there, but we kind of want to suggest that if you're a library author, and that includes Microsoft, by the way, in, in a, a, you know, as a big time library author. If you're a library author, maybe consider the time between now and .NET 5, which is slated for November of next year. Uh, treat that as the nullable adoption phase. This is the time where it would be a really good idea for you to adopt uh, null in your uh, public API and the, the surface area that your clients consume. And then, uh, on the flip side, if you're a client of these APIs, expect there to be, that, to be some churn in that period of time. Right? So expect that um, you won't get nullable annotations from your favorite libraries tomorrow. It might be whenever it's natural for them next to ship a version, you know, when they've had time to go through and do the work and roll out normally. So let's give, us, give everyone a breather and think about the next um, year and a bit as the nullable adoption phase where there will be some churn. And if you adopt this as a client, you should be OK with your library sort of gradually coming online. And therefore, warnings gradually may be popping up in your code. Uh, that might still be the best way for you to go. I would, that's certainly how I will go. Um, but uh, if you don't want that churn, maybe wait until .NET 5 before you turn the nullable feature on as a client. And then um, every, hopefully, most uh, of the ecosystem has settled, and you get an you know, the finished nullable annotations for most of the libraries. And this goes for Microsoft as well. We haven't adopted these for all our libraries because we also kind of want to learn um, from the adoption phase and expand, you know, our knowledge, adjust here and there. Um, and it's also a lot of work just to go and update the entire um, .NET uh, uh, BCL. And so we've updated the core libraries with nullable annotations, but we actually consider them in preview a little bit that we, we will try to keep them stable, but we will change if we did something wrong, if we had like, if we thought about something wrong um, or just messed up, uh, we want to reserve the right to fix those up until .NET 5. So um, that's just a way that we can kind of soften the blow of something that introduces new warnings in existing code and not making it, you know, a big sort of green squiggle uh, jungle for everyone out there. I also, uh, for library writers, um, a lot of library writers don't just target uh, .NET Core 3.0, right? You want, uh, you want reach and you want to target .NET Standard 2.0 maybe so you can get .NET Framework and, and that, that broad set of things that you can target that way. And so um, we're cognizant of that and we, what we recommend uh, to do, say if you're using Visual Studio is, you know, um, multi-target between .NET Core 3.0 and uh, .NET Standard 2.0. Um, that means you can't turn on C Sharp 8 in the, uh, in the UI of Visual Studio, for instance, because lots of C Sharp 8 things won't work properly when you do that. But if you consider yourself an expert, uh, you can go and manually do it in the project file. And that's probably the best way to go 
um, as you try to both, um, and th this should work just fine, you try to both get the nullable annotations that are in .NET Core 3.0 and get the warnings for those, but you, uh, but you also want to uh, generate code that, um, that reaches all of .NET Standard 2.0. So this is how we recommend that you go. And um, if you want to check out more things, there are blog posts out there that have come out over the uh, last couple of years around it. And the docs are already excellent around nullable reference types. So here's a, um, a set of, um, of links that you can follow and, um, and get the docs. And with that, I want to turn it over to you out there and your questions. And, um, and we've got five minutes, so uh, shoot away. Yeah, so we've had a lot of buzz on Twitter. People are really excited about the nullable reference types. Um, so how about, let's see, what's our first one? Uh, oh, I had it picked out, and then I, OK. Let's see. Definitely doesn't like, look like the C Sharp we're writing in 2001. People are pretty pumped about that. I hope that's let's a positive see. remark. <laughs> so if we use, <laughs> it is, totally. The language is always growing. Um, so if we use um, nullable with older versions of .NET, uh, will it throw an error or warning? Um, oh, that's right. I should click on it. So okay. unless we update it to .NET 3, is that, is that when the warning appears? Uh, the, you need to run C Sharp 8. That's, the, that's a, the only thing you really need for the nullable feature to work. Now, uh, if you use .NET Core 3.0, then A, C Sharp 8 is on by default in Visual Studio, and B, you get those annotations that I talked about in the core libraries, um, because those are only part of .NET Core 3. They, aren't, they don't exist for the other versions of the framework, for older versions right. of the framework. But, that, but you can still use the feature. Um, and the only thing is, if you want to use C Sharp 8 against older things, then it's not, it's not supported, right? It's not mm -hmm. something that you can just go and select from a menu in Visual Studio, because many other C Sharp 8 language features will not work properly. So, but this is one that actually works pretty neatly downstream. So um, if you have the guts uh, to go and turn it on manually in the project file, um, then we're not going to stop you. All right. So you can use it with .NET Framework. That's that correct. It? Sweet. All right. So that was part one of C Sharp 8. I think we're ready for part two with Bill. I can hand it over to you now. All righty. Thank you very much, Kendra. Thank you, Mads. So, Matt's talked primarily about nullable reference types, which we devoted an entire half hour to, because that's the one that is going to change how you code the most. It's going to affect those warnings that he talked about. It's going to affect the libraries that you use in terms of how we work with the code that you have. I get to talk about all the fun stuff. It's just things that you can adopt that will just make your life better, but they're not going to introduce warnings as soon as you turn them on. So there's a couple different themes that are really true about what was added in C Sharp 8 outside of nullable reference types? We're going to talk about it as being more modern and more productive. We're going to increase your productivity, and we're going to add features that make it easier for you to work with modern development scenarios. Primarily, those are cloud-based, device-based, programs that run across multiple machines. So let's look quickly at that catalog of features, and then we're going to dive right into code. So the ones that are going to support these modern cloud scenarios, we're going to be talking about async enumerables. We're going to talk about more patterns in more places and how you can use pattern matching, which will do a lot more different things as we're combining applications.